I'm going to talk about uh, Sarcoflex. Uh, it's an adaptive solution towards distant independent visual ability. When we look into history, we see that in the 80s, there was the first multifocal lens invented, or they tried to, to play around with that kind. At that time, they split the lens and glued it together with plus three difference, so for near and far, and implanted that in the eye. So this was quite her heroic, I think, because who would do that today, you know? So in the 80s then, there was the first PMMA lens implanted. It was a diffractive version. Uh, uh, at that time, it was with a six millimeter incision, very high astigmatic uh, post-op uh, situation, so the patients were not very happy. Mm -hmm. But later on, they had uh, refractive bifocal lenses on the market. Uh, so uh, then they had foldable lenses, and then we were uh, confronted with refractive lenses for uh, several years. And in the early 2000s, the first bifocal diffractive lens was on the market. The first Sarcoflex add-on lens, it was the first add-on lens on the market, was introduced in 2007. And in 2014, the first, I don't like the expression, but mm -hmm. to tell everybody who uses it, EDOF lens was used in 2014. And now we have over 100 different 100 performance IOLs on the market. So it's quite kind of confusing right now. I'm going to tell you something about Sarcoflex today, but first I also want to give you some impression on the physical and optical properties of the different concepts. So we have refraction and diffraction. These concepts, I would like to tell multifocal concepts. All of these, no matter if it's diffractive or refractive, create halos because you have more images on the retina. You always have to have halos in this kind of optical property. We also have small aperture lenses. You know this IC8 lens, for instance. It has a hole, a pinhole effect, and that's the only situation where we should use EDOF, extended depth of focus. That's the optical principle of EDOF, only this kind of small aperture. Everything else is something else. And then we use chromatic aberration. We use higher order aberrations, mainly aspherisity, spherical aberration. And these lenses, I would like to tell them ear of lenses, extended range of vision. They help us to have a, a, not a focus point. They make, they stretch this point and create some kind of a, let's say, focus line. This is very important right now. And then we also have this hybrid lenses. We all, everybody says it's an EDOF lens, but definitely a lot of these lenses have diffractive optics. So all these lenses have to have halos, no matter if you call it EDOF or not. You know? So a lot of these kind of lenses are still multifocal lenses. They just want, for marketing reasons, I would say, use the term EDOF. I would like to tell them hybrid lenses. They use aesthericity and combine it with multifocal optics. We have this kind of extended range of vision with astigmatism. Astigmatic correction helps us to, to create some kind of intermediate vision, for instance. And we have, as I mentioned already, the spherical operation. We may use a negative or a positive spherical operation. And if we have a spherical operation, we have a wider focus line, and that helps us especially in the intermediate area, to, to create some usable uh, function of your vision. And on the optical bench, you see that? That's interesting, I think. We had this optical bench, and if we do some EDOF testing, you see that some of these lenses have more peaks. And if you have more than one peak, you definitely have a multifocal lens. We also may use asymmetrical situations, monovision, and especially with ear of lenses, we also may use these kind of lenses for a monovision correction in order to extend your visual ability to the near part. We have bifocal refractive lenses. They have a wider area of function, of near function, and we have 
Diffractive lenses, they are slimmer, they have a more precise focus line, a more shorter focus line, and there we have bifocal or trifocal diffractive lenses. So in conclusion, I think it's important to say that EDOF lenses, per definition, only are small aperture lenses, as the IC8, for instance. AIROF lenses, they are utilizing higher order aberrations in order to, uh, to, to help us with the near distance. And hybrid lenses use both concepts. They combine asphericity and multifocality in order to create uh, uh, a solution. Multifocal IOLs have definitely the, the highest level of, of distance independent visual ability, especially trifocal lenses because they have in the intermediate, in the near and in the far distance um, a focus. And we also should include in our terminology the asymmetry, monovision, because we may use these lenses, no matter which kind of optical property, in a symmetrical way or in an asymmetrical way to say monovision, for instance. Negative dysphotopsias may occur with any high performance lenses. The higher the performance, the higher the chance that you create some dysphotopsia. And the higher the level of distance independent visual ability, the higher the chance of these photic phenomena. And the level of DIVA influences susceptibility on tilt, centration, and contrast. So if we use these kind of lenses, we have to have to almost guarantee to try to get a very well-centered and a very parallel positioned lens, no Pro, no, no tilt, centration should be in, used by the surgeon at least, but we definitely know that sometimes anatomical situations uh, lead to decentration without any fault of, from the surgeon's side. So if we have all high IOL performance IOLs together, I did this uh, graph here, we never would create the perfect situation for distance independent visual ability as we have in an accommodative situation of a UVNI lens. So we can simulate some situation, we can help the patients, and we have to hear and listen to the patient in order to realize and to know which is the best solution for the patient. Is it monovision? Is it an ear of lens? Is it an ear of lens? Or is it a multifocal lens? And now, this was some kind of an introduction. Uh, I would like to give you um, and to present you my idea and my, the history of the Salcos Flex lens, which was first implanted 15 years ago. I did the surgery at the university clinic at that time. This lens is, a hydrophilic, is of hydrophilic material, which is important because hydrophilic material uh, has a high UVL biocompatibility. And we put that lens into the Salcos. It's not in a capsular bag, so it's closed and it has contact to vascularized tissue. For that reason, it's important that you have a high UV biocompatibility. And that time, we could show that acrylic, hydrophobic acrylic material is not as UV biocompatible as compared to hydrophilic. So I think it's important that this lens is made of hydrophilic acrylic. Right now, there are three typical companies who have an additive lens on the market. It's the crystal lens, all are single piece and all are hydrophilic. Uh, it's the Rayner lens and it's the first Q lens. I mentioned that already, this is some kind of the history. And it's important that uh, a cadaver eye study sh showed that this lens has a acceptable, good uh, place in the sulcus. It is a well-centered and it has no contact to UVL tissue beside the haptic endpoints where they have to to, to bring the lens into position. And another question was if the optical performance of two lenses in the eye with four surfaces has the same quality as compared to a single lens with two surfaces in the eye. And Schrecker was the first to publish that could show then that the additional light loss of a second lens is less than 1%. So it's very similar to a single lens in the capsular bag. So the optical performance is the same. Here, this is the results of 15 years follow-up of 200 lenses. You see here 
Uh, it is a lens with a concave posterior surface. You have a contact only in the periphery, so in the central zone there is no contact between the two lenses, which is important because if you have a contact, you flatten the surface and then you have a hyperobjective focus. So because of that, it's important that this lens is concave and only has in the periphery some contact. And you also see here a UBM picture, the iris and the, the distance to the, from the anterior surface to the iris. That's also important because iris shaving is some kind of a concern in that kind of, 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 of uh, uh, surgery. Uh, uh, you see that there is a, a good distance because of the posterior angulation of the haptic so that this lens is shifting backwards and has no, almost no contact, if it's in the right position, no contact to the iris. We also did a centration study where we could show on the same eye, the sulcus eye, lens and the bag lens, and we could show that the sulcus position and centration was significantly superior to the bag lens. The lenses are not, have a different position and a different kind of, of, of centration, one in the bag and one in the sulcus. And it seems that the sulcus uh, provides a better centration as the bag, and what definitely is the, the truth, it stays because the sulcus is not shrinking or changing. There is no myofibroblastic metaplasia or something like this, which happens in the capsule bag, as we all know. We have specific indications. Here, this is my first case of a two-year-old boy. I did a congenital cataract. Here you see the anterior vitrectomy, the lens implantation, and I put a sulcoflex on top in order to make the patient emetropic. And after his myopic shift, Three years later, on the lower side, you see the, the, the exchange of that lens. When there was a myopic shift, the same eye, I, I, I exchanged that lens. I put the sulcoflex lens out and implanted another one in order to keep the patient almost in some kind of an emetropic situation. So you also can, may use uh, this kind of lens in some such special situations. Or for instance, in silicone oil, where you have a change of your refraction, you also may correct a silicone filled eye with an additive lens. And later on, when we remove the silicone oil, we also may remove the, the, the add-on lens and we stay in a refractive acceptable, acceptable position. So the conclusion after 15 years Supplementary IOLs are effective for secondary enhancement of the surgical result. If you have a biometrical surprise, for instance, if you are not at zero or what, where you wanted to aim, you can easily bring the patient to the situation you want to have. And for primary duet implantation, so for implantation of a bag lens, for monofocal bag lens and a multifocal lens on top. At that time, it was a bifocal refractive lens. So the next step was to create a trifocal add-on lens, a diffractive lens, not only a refractive bifocal lens. And the technology is the same as the Rayner trifocal lens, which is already on the market for the capsular bag lens. And this optic is now, what now it is now, four years ago, was now put on the optic of the sarcoflex lens. The surgery, the IOL calculation, I think, Dr. Mendelstein, you will, will tell us more about biometry and this kind of, of important topic. But usually it's easy going and straightforward. If you have a biometrical surprise, you take the spherical equivalent. And if it's hyperopic, you multiply it with 1.5. And if it's myopic, you want to multiply it by 1.2. You could also use some virgins formulas or something. but. As, at, as long as they are between plus and minus seven diopters, you have a very exact uh, solution if you just go straight forward and use the spherical equivalent and multiply it. For do-it procedures, I always go for emetropia for the bag lens, to have the patient emetropic at least, and I put a zero lens with the additional rings for intermediate and near on top into the sulcus. Here you see the surgery. I use a 2.5 millimeter incision. You don't see the whole cataract surgery right now. Then it's important that here, you, you may use any uh, bag lens you want. It can be of hydrophobic material, of hydrophilic material, or even silicone if you still have some of these lenses. And then it's important that you remove the viscoelastic from the bag, 
you again instill viscoelastic behind the iris to lift the iris to have a, an area, a, a place, a space for the, the sulcus and for the haptics. And here you see that lens. It's a, you have here a folder. You put the lens into the cartridge. It's not preloaded. You have to do that by yourself, but it's straightforward and quite easy. It's just important that uh, the, the, the trailing haptic is not entrapped backwards, so you, you put the trailing haptic a little bit forward, so you put it on the optic in order to have a, a, a smooth implantation. And then through 2.5 millimeters, you put the, the leading haptic behind the iris. This was my first implantation, and here you will see that this haptic was behind the optic, but it's not a problem. Hydrophilic materials don't stick together too much, as we know from hydrophobic uh, lenses sometimes. Uh, and then you bring the trailing haptic in the eye, and with a spatula, you easily may uh, bring the haptics in position. You just bring that behind. Then it's important that you remove the whole viscoelastic because as these haptics are so soft, you have to remove all the viscoelastic material that they really unfold totally and bring the lens into a centered position. Remove the, the viscoelastic from the interface and from the anterior chamber. Here, yeah, that's the end then. So this duet implantation, the results, we compared uh, that to the bag ray one trifocal lens, and you see here the defocus curve was similar, was almost the same. We published that in the Journal of Refractive Surgery. And after half a year, we had the same defocus curve. There was no change of defocus. It was to expect to be like that, but we had to promise it. Uh, and that's important and interesting. Here, the Heidelberg results of the Salcoflex lens, they compared the single ray one lens to the add-on duet procedure, and they showed that there was no difference, no significant difference in the strail ratio. And here I mentioned that already, the ref reflectance of uh, the lens was 0.8%. And for instance, a, an Acrisoft lens has a reflectance of 1.1%. So it's, it's, it's not a difference of light quality when you use two lenses as compared to the use of one lens. We also can use this for secondary enhancement. If you have a monofocal pseudophagic patient, you also may implant a lens on top afterwards. Here you see the, there's some after cataract. You can do that also if the patient has yacked already, but in that case, I prefer to first implant the lens on top, and if necessary, I would uh, do the yak laser later on. But no matter, you can have it the other way around too. Yeah? Uh, the only one thing uh, I'm a little bit concerned with that situation, if you have a monofocal patient who has a very good vision, and you put a multifocal lens on top with halos, he has less contrast and he has these halos and this photopsia. So you have to tell the patient very strictly and definitely that he will have these halos and that he will, uh, it's a trade-off that you have maybe no use of spectacles anymore, but you will have maybe a different quality of vision because you have a multifocal lens in the eye. So that's kind of tricky, but there was a, a multifocal a multi-center study uh, of, with, with seven sites in Europe, uh, and they could show that in the photopic uh, situation, there was no significant difference between the monofocal eye to the post-op, the duet eye. In the mesopic, there was some difference. Definitely, we have to expect that there is less contrast in the uh, multifocal situation. Uh, but here the patient satisfaction was quite high and they accepted that situation quite well. So I think secondary implantation of a lens on a pseudophagic patient makes sense, but you always have to think about this kind of what I mentioned already. So in conclusion of this study, we could say that all patients were satisfied with the vision. Uh, there was no surgical complication. It's a straightforward surgery I mentioned already. Uh, and there is no difference to the result with the trifocal in the bag lens. But supplementary IOLs offer a reversible option, and that's the big difference. And here you see a 
an explantation of a patient who was not happy, that happens with multifocal lenses. With a hook, I bring out the, the one haptic through the wound, 2.5 millimeter, and then just I grasp with an implantation forceps, I grasp the optic end and extract it. You don't have to cut it or fold it because it's soft, it's, it's thin, it's zero diopters. It's thin, you just take it and, and pull it out. So in my opinion, it's an almost reversible procedure. It's straightforward and you never know what happens in the future. There's also the option of fine tuning because these lenses are in quarter steps, not only in half a diopter steps, they're also in quarter steps. Uh, and uh, you may use that lens and you, in, in a wider uh, situation, in a wider indication spectrum, because you, it is a reversal procedure. And you may have expect some early explantation, as we also have with, uh, with multifocal lenses in the bag, but that's a problem in a lot of cases. You can have photopic phenomena, and in that situation you can explant that. And we never know in our patients what happens in the future, in 10, 20 years, if the patient develops an AMD, if he develops a diabetic macular edema, glaucoma, whatsoever. With that situation, you also can explant the lens 10 years, 20 years after. So the optical quality is identical to single trifocal IOLs with the Salcoflex trifocal, but it's reversible. And in my opinion, the main indication is in phakic patients, multifocal duet implantation, and in pseudophakic patients, multifocal enhancement and the cure of a biometrical surprise. Thank you. Thank you. And um, talk about uh, the calculation of additive IOLs. Um, those are just my uh, financial disclosures. So um, let me start with some, some basics for IOL calculation. Uh, what do I need to calculate the lens? Those are basically five steps or five things I need to, I need to take into my scenario and to consider. I think the first one is pretty self-explanatory, so I need to, have to know my target refraction, where I want to land. Um, the second one is a, bit, um, is a bit more interesting. It's the, uh, the optic, optics law, the, the law of optics that I'm, I'm choosing. Uh, I have two cho choices to make. I can uh, calculate uh, with the Snellius um, law or with the Gauss um, paraxial optics. Uh, what are the differences? So um, Snellius law has not a defined, um, defined best focus, but I need to choose my focus between different points. Is it the least ray scatter? Is it the um, the least uh, mean absolute error. So I have different points to choose from. Um, I think that uh, I have to take into account more data. So I have the, the, um, the anterior cornea, the posterior cornea, and measurements are not quite there, at least for the posterior cornea. So I have some, um, I have some room for measurement error um, that goes into my calculation. On the other hand, with uh, Gauss or uh, Gaussian optics, I have um, paraxial uh, optics which allow me to calculate in linear optics, um, but I cannot take account of spherical aberration and asphericity. Uh, I, think, I think you can see it here on the, on the um, left, on the right picture. Um, if you see this one as the iris, um, the whole rays are just bundled uh, onto the, onto the um, five, um, onto a very narrow room uh, where you can calculate it. And um, this allows us to um, get spherical optics into um, the cornea, into the lens, and I can move to thin lens optics for my calculations. So another thing I need is an eye model or a model eye um, where I can take my data from that, I'm, uh, that I can't measure. There are different eye models. One of the most famous ones is the Gullstrand eye from 1909. Um, a very interesting 
um, model as it um, is basically based on only six eyes. Um, then numerous other models have come. I think the, the currently most modern one or the currently accepted one is the Leo and Brennan model. Um, they have certain differences in, in curvature ratios from anterior to posterior curvature, um, refractive indices, um, the, the corneal refractive index, um, the, 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 the vitreous uh, refractive index, and also the, the aqueous refractive index, which are different between the models, especially in the Navarro um, model, which is quite interesting because the other models basically have the same refractive index for anterior chamber and vitreous, but Navarro has two, uh, sorry, yeah, Navarro has two different um, refractive indices. Um, the next thing I, I um, have to take into my scenario is the calculation method that I'm choosing. Basically for additive lenses, all calculation or most calculation methods um, are based on the van der Heide formula, which was um, published in 1988. Uh, the good thing for this uh, virgins formula um, as compared to um, in the back eye calculation is that you don't need to take account of the axial eye length and uh, that you know the lens position and the the lens refraction already, so you can um, take the refraction as is and calculate from there on. Um, there's not really a formula for ray tracing right now. So ray tracing is a very interesting concept, especially for, for in the back calculation. But as I just said, um, this is something that might come in the future. But um, I think we're pretty good with the, with the additive lenses already. So um, we'll see what the future brings. And the fifth point is I need measurement parameters to, um, to, to fill in all values that I need for my calculations. What are those? So from my schematic eye model that I um, just showed um, um, is where I can get the refractive indices that I'm taking for my calculations. Then I have my measurements, which is the subjective refraction, which is basically the main parameter as we just heard. Um, for the eye calculation, but if you go into virgins formulas, um, you also need to measure the anterior chamber depth. You need to take into account the, the corneal um, power or, or, or the radius. And uh, you can also take into account the central corneal thickness. Then I have some, um, some parameters that are um, something I need to um, either guess or I can use to um, get a fix for some other parameters that might not be right, like the refractive indices, which is the effective lens position, as we know from basically um, in the back IELTS. And we still have lens constants, which are also a topic for additive IELTS. Uh, what are my, my, what's my room for, for errors? So one thing I have to take into account, like I do for, um, for normal cataract surgery, is the surgically induced astigmatism. Um, when I'm calculating with surgically induced astigmatism, I always have to remember that it's not a plus and minus um, calculation. Um, I can't just take a mean value or a, a median value, but I'm, I'm calculating with centroids. So basically I have like an, uh, I have like a fog of, of um, values because it's, it's, um, I have a very big standard deviation for surgically induced astigmatism and I will take the center at the middle of my, of my fog or of my cloud um, to center my surgery on. Uh, I can do that either directly or I can do that with my lens constants and um, see that I, I kind of take that into account with uh, optimized lens constants. Um, more room for error is in the cornea. Usually what we're doing is anterior keratometry and we're putting a refractive index on those anterior curvature values to get power out of it. And in this keratometric index is um, um, the cornea thickness and the posterior cornea curvature. Um, Impl implicit, implicit, um, I hope everybody understands that. Um, 
so we're just thinking uh, the rest of the cornea into our model. Um, the older indices which are still used are the Javal index with 1.3375 or the Zeiss index with 1.332. Um, both indices are um, overpowering the cornea a bit, and we know that probably the, the Leo Brennan um, index with uh, 1.336 is a bit uh, nearer to the reality, but still um, out of reasons for, um, for, for backward compatibility. So all lens constants we have are all with those old values, and we don't want to go away from the lens constants, um, at least right now. Um, as there are big numbers uh, needed to get newer constants. Um, so we're keeping those wrong indices. And um, this is something that is accounted for with the effective lens position. So basically, if you have too much corneal power, you have to shift the lens a bit backwards um, to catch that, um, which is perfectly um, working in normal eyes. But if you have um, some scoot anterior segment parameters, you might get into problems within the back lenses a bit more than with additive lenses because the diopters are a bit um, less, but um, those are the, the, um, uh, the exceptions from the rule with the uh, with 1.5 and 1.2 um, conversion from the spherical equivalent. Um, this is for, for the higher part um, additive lenses with skewed um, ratios, anterior segment ratios, where this gets interesting. So, I have the ELP concept, um, which I just said, which is kind of a, a parachute for, for all other model um, mistakes I'm having there. Um, I usually have some kind of concept, which is um, called surgeon factor or effective vault or something like that with additive lenses. Um, this takes into account the, the refraction lane. So do I have a re refraction lane of four meters, of six meters, or do I have infinity? The haptic design, I can compensate for uh, my surgical induced astigmatism or my, my surgical technique. Um, pupil size, asphericity. So there are some, some factors in that um, constant um, yeah, implied. And an optimization process leads usually to better results and, and can help me um, also with additive lenses to, to um, get a second calculation, maybe just uh, if you have the Rayner calculation and, and, and want to see how do I come out with a, with a second um, calculation, you can use that and, and um, use that to, to choose between two lenses if you want to implant the 1.5 or 2.0 adapters and um, just want a second thing to see. Um, another thing with effective lens position is that it does not need to be the, the XI lens position, so the real lens position. Um, but it can be out of the center of the IR. So basically with um, plus lenses or minus lenses, um, it can be behind or in front of the lens. Um, so I can have an effective vault or surgeon factor, or however you want to call it, um, that puts my lens into the natural lens or the um, intraocular lens that is already implanted or into the vitreous, um, just to take it into account all those uh, all, all those parameters, the, the, the refractive indices, and all the error parameters. So what do I base my IOL power calculation on? If I have duet implantation, I obviously do not have an intraocular lens in the eye, but I have a crystalline lens in the eye. So I have to base my calculation on the biometry values. Um, so basically the target refraction of my of my um, IOL. And if I want to fix astigmatism, I have to rely on the corneal cylinder from the biometry or tomography or whatever you, you base it on. If I have a pseudophagic correction, um, I'm using the subjective refraction of the patient, which is the most, um, the most decisive factor for, for my lens choice. And also the manifest cylinder uh, from the subjective refraction if I'm talking about toric uh, additive IOLs. There are some um, things to say about uh, subjective refraction. So first thing is um, that usually when we're talking about IL um, calculation schemes, we're usually talking about the uh, infinity. Um, but 
the thing we're measuring is never infinity, but it's usually our refraction in a four meters or six meters. And we can calculate that to infinity if we want to. So basically from four meters to infinity, it's minus 0.25 diopters um, and um, minus 0.17 diopters to convert from six meters to uh, infinity. Uh, that's basically a thing um, which I can, which I can um, uh, take into account with my with my lens constant. So if I'm if I'm optimizing my lens constant, I want infinity. I can, I can um, just take 60 cases, 40 cases, 80 cases, and and fix my lens constant so that I'm I'm having the six meter refraction lane or the infinity refraction lane for my calculations. Um, so with um, Rayner lenses, we're usually talking about um, about pseudophagic patients. So I'm basing my refraction on, subject, on a subjective refraction, not an objective refraction. I don't want an autorefractometer. Um, there are various problems with um, pseudophagic patients, um, which lead me to, to, to skewed values. Um, the, the Abbey index of the, the IOL, chromatic aberrations, which are different, so I can't use my autorefraction for those patients. Another mistake um, that can be made is for the correction of multifocal IRs, so add of IRs. So if I'm um, performing a subjective refraction of those patients, I always have to remember that I, um, that I need to fog them into the plus direction. So I'm coming from the plus side um, so, and not from the minus side. So I don't go into the, into the new addition. Um, otherwise, if I, if I base my correction on the, on the new addition, obviously, um, I will take him all, uh, all ability to read and, and have intermediate visual acuity and um, just move the, the near visual acuity to my distance visual acuity um, and all other, um, all other uh, benefits of the multifocal IR will get lost in the process. So that's just um, a scheme I have. Um, uh, I have stolen um, from Mrs. Abraham is her name, um, and uh, it just shows the, the scheme of uh, putting 1.5 diopters um, as a fogging uh, starting point uh, for my subjective refraction with uh, multifocal IL patients and, and subjective refraction. So what calculation methods do I have if I want to calculate my, my additive IOL? Uh, I have the ray trace um, website or software uh, where I can uh, get my calculation from Rayner. So I can choose between my Psychoflex model. Um, do I want to calculate an aspheric IRL, a trifocal IRL, or toric IRL? And then I can fill in my values. Either I can just fill in my subjective refraction or I can uh, fill in some further biometric uh, values like the anterior chamber depth and the K values. And then uh, beneath we can see the, the different models and the target refraction for those models. Mm, another option um, can be found on the University Saarland uh, website. We have this JFACIC software which can be used for um, either FACIC IOLs or additive IOLs, um, which is a matrix calculation. Uh, I can just enter my values there and, and get an another um, IR calculation. Um, I think the hardest value about this calculator is the uh, post-operative lens position that has to be entered, uh, which I obviously don't know beforehand. I can get this from the, from the biometry and just um, figure some, something like 0.3 millimeters or something like that um, as a vault between both IOLs. Oh, which is good if I'm using it um, for the correction of an, of an pseudophagic patient, but this is harder for uh, duet implantation because I can't measure the anterior chamber depth of the, uh, of the patient with the crystalline lens. Um, the third possibility is a formula that um, I have just um, submitted to the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Um, it's basically a thick lens um, formula, thick lens cornea model um, formula, um, where you can um, play with the, with the IRL constant. Um, if you use this, I would um, suggest to use different constants for plus and minus lenses. Um, 
Um, basically, the, the model is based on the Leo and Brennan I model. So if you don't enter your own measured values of CCT, um, you can use a CCT of 500 micrometers and um, um, uh, uh, anterior to posterior curvature ratio of 6.4 to 7.77, which is already entered in an Excel sheet. Um, I can just um, give that Excel sheet to Rainer and whoever is interested in that can just email them and, and get, the, get the Excel. Um, what do I do if I want to get the post-operative um, anterior chamber depth, either for um, the linz humboldt castro formula or the j Fackick formula? So a thing I can do is um, use the IOLCon website, um, which has now the, the LPCM module, the lens power calculation module entered of the castro formula. Um, this formula has not an ELP, but an ALP prediction. So it really tries to predict the real post-operative lens position. Um, so I can get the estimated lens position and just sub subtract um, half of the lens thickness of the inserted uh, lens, um, which can be found in the internet, um, which will basically the, the which will, will be basically the post-operative anterior chamber depth in my crystalline lens patient. Um, I'm getting some kind of looks that this was not clear. Is th was that understandable? What you're talking about? Yeah. No, no, it's fine. Okay. Perfect. Um, so moving from theory to actual calculation. Uh, this one is a patient who was a refractive surprise six months after cataract surgery. And as I can see on the right eye, we have an objective refraction of one diopter with minus one diopter cylinder. And the subjective refraction is 1.5 uh, sphere and minus 0.5 cylinder. Um, corrected, it's 1.2 decimal visual acuity. And we want to calculate the lens now. So the first thing I would use with Rayner lens is obviously the manufacturer's calculation. Um, we can go to the ray trace um, website and uh, use our values. So we get the, the subjective refraction, fill that in, um, fill our biometry values in, and uh, we can either use the 1.5 diopters lens to um, get a 0.2 uh, diopters uh, target refraction or minus 0.2 diopters target refraction with a, with a 2.0 diopters lens. Um, Beneath you can see uh, the, the LHC formula, um, which is kind of similar. It's uh, 0.02 and minus 0.4, but I just used um, I just used um, an effective vault of minus 0.3 because I have not enough cases to optimize lens constants. It might be a different va value if I if I'm um, adding cases to it and then can really optimize my lens constants with it. Um, the second case is a bit more interesting, I think. Uh, this was a patient we had um, for a duet implantation, um, but we have a little twist in there. So we didn't, did not just want to do ametropia for both eyes, but we said if we, um, if we have to strip the, um, the multifocal additive IRL, we still want to have monovision beneath that. So we didn't just calculate the in the back uh, IOL and put a zero diopter IOL inside, but we uh, tried with contact lenses before if he likes um, the monovision and um, found a monovision uh, with minus 1.5, uh, minus 1.25 diopters on the right eye, perfect for him. Um, so um, I used the Kane formula and the Castro formula here and uh, looked which lens to take, which was the 25.5 diopters IOL. Um, with a target refraction of minus 1.21 and minus 1.33. Um, at the same time, I'm getting the, the estimated lens position, so the post-operative -op anterior chamber depth, depth, so to speak, with uh, 5.028 uh, millimeters. And I can now use that um, in my lens calculation. So here's the Rayner calculation. Um, as you can see, I have the, the anterior chamber depth, or depth of 4.58. So um, I subtracted half of the lens thickness of the artificial lens from it, um, used my k-values. I, um, um, yeah, and, and, and used the, um, the preoperative refraction of 
of minus 1.21 diopters, which was the target refraction of the artificial lens in the back. Um, and uh, so we had the choice of um, basically a minus 2.0 uh, diopters IRL or minus 1.5 diopters IRL. Um, yeah, basically again the LHC, form LHC formula, we, you can enter um, the same values and, and um, see if, the, if, if both are um, agreeing. And that was what we basically did and what was implanted. And um, I just saw him yesterday and he was very happy and with uh, uh, uncorrected 120% visual acuity. So that um, landed really good. Um, another thing we can talk about is duet implantation. What lens do I choose for my capsular bag? So obviously I can, um, I can use either um, an aspheric IOL or an aberration neutral IOL, um, which brings me um, either benefits in the contrast sensitivity or benefits in the depth of field. Um, aspheric IOLs are a bit more complicated when it comes to decentration and um, tilt. Um, that's something I have to ponder and see if, if everything is stable with the capsular bag, if the capsular bag is very big or, or res they're res rather small. And um, if I have Casia 2 or something, I can even look at the um, tilt and centration of the crystalline lens um, to get hints. And another thing I can look at is the spherical aberration of the eye and the, the aberrations of the, of the patient and see if, or of the cornea of the patient, and um, if I want to correct uh, the spherical aberration um, with a special IOL type. So I have um, IOLs that correct around minus 0.27 of spherical aberration. I can put that in, in patients that have more spherical aberration, and I can, can put models with less um, spherical aberration correction into patients with uh, less spherical aberrations. And if I have some, some patients after uh, laser vision correction or keratoconus or something like that, um, which have very low spherical aberration, I can put in my aberration neutral uh, model and uh, put the aberration, aberration neutral uh, uh, circuflex on top. Uh, basically, this is my, my decision tree. When do I choose what? So um, if I have a patient with postoperative um, corneal astigmatism, um, or uh, postoperative astigmatism, I can decide if, if um, uh, sucroflex aspheric is enough, um, if the correction is, is, um, brings enough visual acuity, or if I have to use a toric model and um, move to the toric model um, if I see the fit for that. Otherwise, um, with the trifocal uh, model, I can, um, I can see if, uh, if the uh, if the corneal uh, astigmatism is too high, so I want to correct it beforehand with the, with the um, in the back IOL and uh, plan that um, yeah beforehand. So I'm uh, open for discussion now and looking forward later on to get to know your um, way of dealing with uh, sarcoflex patients. <laughs>